Hey, welcome back from break. Hello, uh, I'm Bill Buchanan, and uh, I've been involved with the BBA for, for, for a couple of years. So we have an exciting uh, session uh, with, uh, with quite a, a varied uh, line of research. Uh, if I could ask everyone just, just to mute themselves, is that, is that possible? Uh, hello, could, could I ask everyone? Could I ask uh, uh, you, Raj, to, to mute? That's great. Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, I'm a professor of applied cryptography, so I come into this very much from a, from a technical uh, point of view. So, uh, our work has led to three highly successful uh, spin-out companies, uh, Zone Fox acquired by Fortinet, Symphonic uh, acquired by... Uh, Ping Identity, and we have an amazing new uh, spinet called Sign Forensics, which is doing well across the world. So we're a great believer in transforming research, core research, addressing core problems, and identifying how you can best make an make impact. So we've been really in this area of identity and citizen-focused systems for around uh, 10 years. And we're especially keen on making sure that the citizen integrates into health and, and social care. And when you think about it, the internet was created uh, 40, 50 years ago. And what we've ended up with is, is a system which is scaled, uh, but really which has very little trust uh, integrated in, into it. So our uh, work really scales back to the 1970s through the work of Whitfield Diffie, Ralph Merkel, and uh, Reves Shamir and uh, Edelman. And they really created uh, what we see now as the drive towards public key encryption. The magical little key, the magical little private key is the thing that can rebuild our society and hopefully build a, a better world a more focused, citizen-focused world and a more centralised focus. One which is not driven by Google, Facebook and the large uh, cloud providers, but one where every citizen has some sort of rights onto the internet. So if we think about it, the world really evolved through the 1990s, uh, through the cypherpunks, Hughes, May and Gilmore, proposed a new world built on uh, public key encryption. So our work here is really focused on cryptography and building the lowest layers of the internet, especially around identity credentials, signing, privacy preserving AI, zero knowledge proofs, trusted IoT, and so on, and almost rebuilding our society from the lowest layer uh, up because we need to make sure that we build both digital trust and human trust. If we don't bridge those two uh, areas, then we are really building on sand. So generally we've been moving away from permissionless ledgers and building most of our work within uh, IBM uh, Hyperledger, typically with uh, Indy and, and Aries. Our current work is really looking at how we can share uh, healthcare records DNS anonymization, privacy preserving AI, uh, IOTA consensus, and really looking at how we can uh, integrate a whole economic infrastructure around uh, healthcare. For our new projects, we have a new EU project called GLASS, which is looking at international e-governance. So at the current time, our systems don't scale well across existing uh, borders. So the GLASS project is looking how we can enable a public, a public governance model uh, using uh, ledgers and things like interplanetary file systems. We also have a project with uh, the University of Oslo funded by the Norwegian Research Council, and that's CyberHunt, which is looking to share threat information on a ledger. And our third project that we're starting just now 
is to build a new smart city infrastructure within Edinburgh. So I'm just going to share my screen to provide you with a few uh, pointers towards some of the work that uh, we have been involved with and, and our core focus. If I can find it. And we really need to worry. We really need to worry that we're building on sand at the current time. So this was a fairly recent attack against the SWIFT network. So the SWIFT network uh, really is the core infrastructure of uh, transactional uh, uh, finance. And this attack here uh, happened when uh, there was an, a, a hack within the Bangladesh Central Bank uh, they had no uh, IT security infrastructure and full-time security operation centers. Uh, really, they, were, they had a, a, a weak infrastructure for security. And what happened there was there was a transaction of 81 million uh, within SWIFT, which was quickly cleared uh, without any, any real uh, problems. But then a 20 million uh, the transaction followed that. And the only reason that it was blocked was that someone uh, noticed that it, that, uh, it was the, the one of the words was spelled as foundation rather than foundation. And it was eventually blocked. So you really must worry that we're building a financial infrastructure which is really uh, uh, built on legacy systems. This one here was a, a recent attack on, uh, on, on, on credit cards where there was a backdoor within the bot, the chat bot, and whenever someone left this website, uh, the, the bot left a, a backdoor which allowed this, the, 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 um, the capturing of uh, user credentials for, for the credit cards. And there was recently an, a, a hack on the BA site. And within the BA site, uh, there was a little bit of extra code uh, added so that when someone uh, uh, entered the credit card details, then those details were actually sent to, to the hacker. So really we need to build a world which is much more focused on the citizen. And GDPR focuses on citizens' rights to their own data. They also have a rights to pseudo anonymity so our transactions need to understand how we remove personally identifiable information. And from our point of view, we need to move from pseudo-anonymity to full anonymity. And that's a difficult thing to do. And only with cryptography can we do this. And GDPR focuses on making sure that encryption becomes a core part of any system. And probably if there's one area in the industry which is weak, it's probably the lack of understanding and integration of encryption into the protection of citizen data. And then finally, we need to be able to respond much quicker and investigate uh, incidents. So from our point of view, we think cryptography has focused on improving system security, but really it could provide a core contribution into improving our society. And we could build a new world based on this cryptography infrastructure. And this shows you how bad our systems are. This was a live event uh, that happened on Sky News. And we can see how weak our existing systems are, that people are still writing their passwords on, on whiteboards. So from our point of view, we run a lab here really focused on use cases and making sure that we can build uh, trusted systems, looking at sovereign identity, zero knowledge proofs, and improved signing. And a new wave of computing is coming along with homomorphic encryption, distributed and privacy preserving machine learning. So we need to start to be rebuilding systems and linking ledgers, cryptography, and AI together to build amazing new infrastructures which have the citizen at its core. And for us, the flawed seven layer model of the internet might be replaced by something like this. At the lowest layer, we have cryptography, mathematics, 
certainty. At the present time, we build on Ethernet and we build on weak foundations. But this cryptography will go nowhere unless we build a software engineering layer in between. And we need to make sure that all the great things that happen at the maths layer actually are articulated into the systems that we built. So from our point of view, Hyperledger and systems such as that give us a software engineering layer which allows developers to integrate governance, rights, accounting, value, finance and so on onto this layer here. If we don't work on these two layers, then we're building on sand. No one will link from governance into cryptography because it's just too difficult. Without this layer here, we are really struggling. So it's really our focus to make sure that we can build these, these layers. And of course, one of the best that we have is to, is to integrate with the Merkle tree. And it was Ralph Merkle who designed this infrastructure where we could very quickly check our data transactions, create a consensus, hash to the top level and link the hash. In this system, we can audit at any point in time we can make sure that, that every single transaction that we have is trustworthy. So from our point of view, really the cryptography, uh, the, the cryptocurrency work is leading to groundbreaking work. And we should start to move towards a world where we can build ledgers, such as a healthcare ledger. In this way, GPs and the citizen can see this layer. But down below, when we look at it, we have an anonymized layer. At the lowest layer, we see anonymized transactions within the ledger. And only with the rights can we build a banking layer and we can build a health layer. But each of these layers need to be linked into a complex infrastructure. And certainly we see the way that uh, Zcash and Monero have been moving in that we now have a toolkit to be able to create layers which are anonymized and to avoid uh, the flaws with inside public blockchains. Okay, so that's, that's our uh, viewpoint of, of things. So what I'd like to do now is to invite up our, our speakers uh, now. So we're very lucky to have uh, Deepak, uh, who's a software engineer at Microsoft, to give our first talk. Deepak, are you there? Right, yeah. Deepak, where is Deepak? Okay, let me try to look for him. We can have uh, you, you, Raj. Yep. Uh, okay, well, so we'll have a Deepak later, hopefully. Uh, could we have a Yuraj? Okay, I think we go ahead with coma at, at the moment while we try to. Let's the drop okay, go ahead with coma, please. Okay, coma. Koma, on mute and... Uh, hi. Hi, Hello. we can hear you. Yep, would, would, would you like to share your screen and start the presentation? Komal, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I'm sharing the screen. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so Kom Komal is a blockchain researcher at I IIT in India. Okay, yes. So is it visible? Yes, you yeah. are. Yeah, the slide is visible. Uh, so my topic is investment compliance in hedge funds using zero knowledge proofs. 
so which is guided by Shubham Sahai and Professor Sandeep Shukla. So in this presentation, I will first talk about the hedge funds, a brief intro to the hedge funds, then uh, about the Socrates architecture. Can we hear Komal? I can't hear her. Can you yes, hear I me? Can. Yeah, okay. yeah. coming through fine. Okay, so then I will give a brief overview about the design, the problem statement, and then the protocol which we have used, and then results. So now coming to the hedge funds. So uh, to start from the basics, the hedge, fund, hedge funds are more private firms. So these are highly, uh, confidential in nature, they used highly confidential strategies and the fund managers generally avoid any leakage to the strategies as much as possible. So now if we compare the traditional funds and the hedge funds, first of all, in terms of the returns, uh, as compared to the traditional funds, hedge funds are generally expected a slightly higher returns. And now uh, in terms of the participation, in, term, uh, in traditional funds, there are actually no restrictions or very low restrictions about who can participate and who cannot. And in hedge funds, only the sophisticated investors are allowed, like a very well-known organizations or an individual with a very high net worth. Uh, lastly, in terms of the portfolio, in which we, we are interested. Uh, in the traditional funds, it's generally same for all the investors and it's generally public, publicly, uh, it's published on their portal. But in case of the hedge funds, there is no guarantee about the, your portfolio, about your allocations, like where your amount is invested in, which, which assets it's going. So uh, it can be different or uh, same of, for all the investors. So. Uh, these are not revealed publicly. So if someone is investing in hedge funds, the main goal they have in their mind is to maximize the return, right? But in case of the hedge funds, there is too much, too much risk to uh, take for the investors. So many issues can come here because of the conflict of the investor interest between the fund managers and the investors. Uh, an example would be, uh, let's say, a fund manager is very hopeful about the uh, future of the cryptocurrency, let's say Bitcoin. So he may place a large proportion of the investments in, into the Bitcoin. But as an in, uh, investor, someone may not be comfortable with the uh, 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 investment in the Bitcoin. So, uh, looking at the bit, looking at the risk, the amount of risk it has, and as an asset currently. So, the, due to this conflict of interest between the investor and fund manager, there there can be many issues. So, a complete goal in this in this scenario would be to maximize the returns with risk limitations. So for this, we used a zero knowledge proof systems. Uh, zero knowledge proof system is basically the proof proving that you, know, you have the knowledge of a solution to a problem without disclosing the solution, uh, uh, without disclosing the solution apart from the fact that you know the solution. Now, in our application, we have used Zocrates, which uses Lipsnark. And Lipsnark has many cryptographic primitives to achieve its goal. So besides all that, uh, due to the short time we have, uh, I will cover It looks like, oh, maybe it's the network. Uh, she'll be back. I can see her coming back. In the pre-compiled form on Ethereum. So to verify the identity of the prover, we have used a very simple public-private key crypto encryption system. So where a 
private key is scalar and it is owned by the fund manager and public key is a point on this elliptic list uh, on this on its prospectus so okay Koma, sorry for interjection can you share your slide please i share it looks like you got disconnected oh is it visible N not yet Okay, it's, it's back now. Thank you. So can you see this code? Yeah, so I was saying this in this in the Zocrate system from this very simple code, this is this a computation, this addition is actually modulo P and which is actually uh, this P is actually equal to this group order of this curve VN 128. So we have used this as an advantage and we have used a uh, key uh, uh, public private key systems where this public key is this point on this curve called baby job job I, I don't think we're seeing the the curve actually I think she's coming back. She, she's just had uh, the battery running low pop up. Um, she, yes, she's coming back. Yeah, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, you need to reshare, um, please. Okay, we can see now. So this public key is actually a point on this elliptic curve called baby jab jab. And the private key is a scalar and which is owned by the fund manager. So due to this, uh, only the fund manager can correctly compute the witness for the given program. And to do this efficiently, we have the this curve called baby jab jab. This the parameters of this curve are set, are set like the field order of this curve are actually the group order of this host curve, which is BN128 curve in our case. So due to this fact, all the computations are actually modulo P and we can get a very efficient way to solve this problem. So next uh, is the Zocrits. Uh, very quickly, I will cover the, uh, the processes which the Zocrates has. The first one is compile. Compile takes the higher level code and it converts into it into it uh, intermediate level code or flattened code. Next is compute witness, which takes this flattened code and it generates the witness. Next is setup, which again takes this flattened code and it generates the proving key and the verification key. Next one is generate proof, which uh, takes as an input the witness uh, and the proving key, and it generates the proof and the result of the program. And the last one is the export verifier, which takes the verification key and it generates a contract in Solidity, which we can directly deploy on the Ethereum. So now coming on to the problem statement, which we have used to convince the investors. So first of all, we define some a set of assets A, which contains all the assets which the fund manager uh, used to invest its uh, invest total investment amount. And there are some portfolio weights corresponding to each assets. And these portfolio weights are for a particular investor. And for example, this W1 signifies the uh, the fraction of uh, the total investment for a particular investor, which is invested in this asset A1. So as you can see, for the implicit condition would be that the sum of all this uh, W1 to Wn would be one. So these are the constraints which we need to check in the DSL of the Zockerts program. And sometimes the investors want that the 
individual amount individual uh, this weights should not go above a higher above a particular level so we take this edge as a th risk threshold such that not any of this weight should go above this this is to ensure that uh, this uh, his amount of uh, his investments is actually distributed into all the assets not to a, uh, a single asset so also we define a uh, risk factors called f which is actually uh, this f signifies for fi signifies the amount of risk this uh, asset this uh, fi signifies the amount of risk this uh, a1 has so uh, if we invest in this asset so to uh, taking all this into account first of all we have defined a linear condition that is the this uh, weighted uh, weighted risk factors it should be it should lie between these two uh, these two values x and y and which are given be defined in the prospectus by this by the fund manager or it can be changed by the investor also if discussed and also we have a non linear conditions because sometimes uh, let's say Uh, risk factor for both of the assets Hello, are, are you there? Are you still there? Oh, yes. Yes. I, did you want to conclude? Uh, do you want to go to your conclusion slide? Uh, should I move to the protocol? I, if you could, you have about one one minute. If you could just quickly go through the, um, the outline and then if you could just conclude. Okay, so using this protocol, this protocol has two phases, initial phase and use phase. So using all this protocol, we were able to get the results using Zocrates. Uh, so with this, we got constant verification time with constant proof size and an added advantage to encode the encode quadratic equations, the quadratic constraints, and it can be more of higher degree also, which might be required from the financial point of view. So for uh, the results, the evaluation is divided in two parts. The on-chain verification, which is constant verification, if the number of inputs are same every time. So we have intentionally kept it same for all the number of assets. And for off-chain processes, for verifier, the setup, is uh, compile, set up, and export verifier are the processes, and for prover, compile, compute, witness, and generate two for the processes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I I didn't quite understand the the main problem statement. So you're using ZK snarks, and you are. Uh, are defining that uh, the fund manager will own a private key. Could you just explain what is the privacy preserving aspect of this? What is it you're you're trying to make private and who is it who is it private to? So in this problem, assets are generally which uh, the fund manager used to invest their amounts and the portfolio weights uh, that means the a fraction of amount uh, um, a fraction of their investments which go into each of the assets these are actually not revealed by the fund managers so uh, they, they, they do not reveal it publicly to the investors because this may cause the le leaking of their strategies so this w is the privacy preserving part Yeah. Okay. And only they can see that. 
and the ZK snarks make sure yeah. th that 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 all of the weightings as they're changed is updated, and there is a check to see that that no assets have been lost. Uh, yes, that there that uh, this condition we have uh, like with the socket for this problem. So it should be the fund manager should be able to prove that this value T should lie between X and Y. So with this uh, proof of proofs, uh, it, he can make he can convince to the verifier to the investor that uh, he is behaving properly. I can I ask a second question. So that this looks like uh, a member Wimble or the the kind of new. Uh, presentation for privacy preserving cryptocurrency. Can, so, can I ask you which which work, which research work that you that you build on for for this for this work? This protocol uh, using Zocrates. I, I, I'm asking them for from a research point of view. Whose research work are are you are you building on for this? Oh, sorry, I didn't uh, understand your uh, question. Wh which research papers are you, are you building on uh, to build this? I assume that you're building on the ZK Snarks paper, but are are you are you looking at other research projects uh, that exist at the current time and and maybe can try to keep track of of uh, cryptocurrency privacy preserving work? I have used a ZK Snarks research paper and a Zocrates. And one, uh, this risk assurance portfolio of, uh, by Michael Sislow. Okay, that's great. Okay, th well, th th thank you for that presentation. So I think we've now got uh, our, some of our speakers uh, connected. So, uh, you, Raj, are you, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, great. Okay. So, uh, you, Raj, is a PhD researcher from IIT uh, in in India. Uh, so, do you want to go ahead and share oh, yes. your screen? Yes. 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 So is the screen visible? Yep, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So hello everyone. This is Yuraj Rajendra. Like I'll be presenting a conceptual model on constant storage blockchain. So the flow of presentation will be like this. So we'll be discussing about the motivation, rate at work, and our approach, and we'll be discussing about few scenarios and results and conclusion. So our motivation is like are the current generation blockchains IoT friendly? Like it seems they are partially friendly. What is the reason? The reason is blockchain, it has high growing storage requirements. That is to ensure the chain's integrity, the blocks, has, uh, the blocks will be increasing. Whereas IoT has low storage capacity and it has minimum hardware requirements. It has high hardware. Uh, the hardware capacity will be very much low. So to combine the blockchain and IoT, we need something like quick consensus, low storage and security. In our work, we'll be presenting, we'll be focusing on the low storage and security parts. So like coming to the IoT, Is a trade-off so like if we focus on the utility then the storage cost will increase if you focus on the storage then the utility will be affected so an IoT specific low storage blockchain is very much essential so so this is the related work 
related work the main related work is like iota and ethereum the iota uses snapshots and the snapshots are stored by the developer nodes these developer nodes share the snapshots periodically to the other light node devices in the network and in ethereum it's the same like it uh, the light nodes depend on the full nodes the issue with this thing is like uh, it's not complete decentralization and so like uh, coming to the different types of blockchains if we see different types of concepts like if we only store the recent blocks suppose if we, we store only recent uh, 200 blocks of the blockchain then chain replacement attacks are possible if nodes store random parts of the blockchain then false block insertion attack is also possible so the problem statement is we aim to design a model in which nodes store random parts of the blockchain and the nodes doesn't rely on the full nodes and the nodes ensure the integrity of the chain. And coming to the, our approach, like consider this say, Like consider this diagram like suppose this is a blockchain of length it is having 17 blocks like what we do is like we categorize this uh, blockchain into some sets like suppose here the set size we have considered as five so like we are having three sets here so all the nodes in the network will have same set size and then in the network we won't be having the full nodes all the nodes in the network are light nodes so like um, if the light nodes uh, as the blockchain will be growing like uh, it will be growing so like uh, to uh, hash will be stored in the string fragment like set hash is nothing but the last block in the set it's a hash of the last block in the set and string fragment like we'll be explaining this string fragment in the next slides in the upcoming slides so here this is the blockchain so like the set size is five so blocks from one to five is one set six to ten is one one set and eleven to fifteen is one set so node one is having storage issues so what it does is like it will it will be deleting the old blocks which contains data that is not uh, very much useful for it so what it does is before deletion what it does is suppose it wants to delete the set 6 to 10 what it does is like it will store the set hash of this set the set hash of this uh, set is s2 s2 is nothing but the set hash that is the hash of the 10th block and it will be also storing the string fragment what a string fragment is like uh, like it will it will be storing uh, like suppose like uh, sf2 denotes the string fragment for the set for the set 2 so like uh, what we do is like we'll be taking sixth block hash the hash is a string so we take some random fragment from it sixth sixth block same we do we do for seventh eighth and ninth blocks we concatenate all the fragments collected from these hashes and we make uh, a string a fragmented string hash a concatenated fragment hash and the length of the string fragment is also equal to the hash used in the normal block chains that is 256 bytes so what we do is like us same thing like if the node wants to delete uh, i'm repeating again if the node wants to delete some set or something it will be storing the sets hash and the string fragment so like when the node uh, right now the node has deleted certain blocks suppose it has deleted a sex set two. like here I have strike gun that means the nodes are deleted it doesn't have it has from the 11 12 13 14 15 these blocks are there full blocks are there and the remaining blocks are not there only hash and string fragment are there 
so we have to integrity we have to ensure the integrity of the deleted part that is from 1 to 11 so like uh, uh, in future like the node which deleted is blocked suppose it needs some data which it has deleted so it will ask for the neighboring nodes so this is the node one it will be asking for the neighboring nodes the neighboring node two gives its set which it has these are full blocks and like it has to the node one has to validate the integrity of the missing part so what it does is like it will be first what it does is like it will compare the sixth plus sixth block is there right it will store the it has the parent hash so it will check with the available set hash here and then the second part is like it will check this one like whether the parent hash of 11th block is equal to the 10th one or it can also do one thing like it, it can compare the set hash of this one and the set hash of this block so like in order in order to node one has to like node one only accepts the blocks only if the set given by node two uh, satisfies the following two two things one is it uh, there should be link bit here the second one is the link should be here so like right now we'll explore different scenarios so this is a scenario one like in this scenario what happens is like the um, the link is there between fifth and sixth blocks and uh, the tail end link is also there with 10 dash and 11. So what happens is like this will accept This will accept this segment of blocks these blocks. It will be accepted. But before that so uh, Right now what we have checked the integrity is checked for fifth and sixth blocks and 10th and 11th But not for seventh eighth and ninth. So as we don't have the blocks what we do is like uh, we use the string fragment we have said earlier we use a string format fragment so what we do is like we calculate the string form fragment for this entire set and compare it with the string fragment available with the node one if this if this scenario is set if these conditions are satisfied uh, the set the set provided by node two is will be accepted and coming to scenario two like the first condition only is satisfied and the second condition is not satisfied what this means is like uh, a fork is present what this means is a fork is generated suppose the set size is from 6 dash to 10 dash so what it's saying is like uh, node 1 and node 2 are having the same fifth block but they are not having the same 10th block so what the node 1 can assume is with the available data it can only assume that like it is having consensus up to fifth block with the node 1 with the node 2 and later on in the set somewhere a fork is originated so like in this thing in this scenario node one can't do anything because it is having very much in less information as it is not storing any full blocks or some, anything it is only having the metadata that is the hashes and string fragments so like what we do is so how we deal with this fork so in ethereum and bitcoin like after 23 blocks and six blocks respectively 99 percent of uh, certainty is achieved uh, that is like a block mind will be you on the Yes, yes. Okay, go ahead, continue. Yuraj, can can you continue and and take us to the conclusion? Um, yes, yes, yes. So, like, I will explain this second scenario, and I will conclude. So, like, uh, what will, what we are, how we are dealing with the folks is, um, uh, like, uh, we suggest that nodes shouldn't delete uh, sets of recent X epochs. Suppose, like, uh, we shouldn't delete uh, up to four epochs or something. In Ethereum, one epoch is up to is thirty thousand blocks. That is one week. So, if we say like uh, three epochs or something, it will be three weeks. So, like, uh, even if a fork happens even if the node faces this type of situation what it does is it simply ignores the fork so it simply ignores the fork and the scenario three is like uh, the first condition is not satisfied this one is uh, this one and the second condition is satisfied this shows that the hash collision has occurred so like we recognize the center as a malicious one and ignore 
so like these are the results storage cost and uh, storage cost and block number here k equal to 1 these things are set sizes so with increasing storage cost the communication overhead reduces like uh, storage cost is inversely proportional to the communication overhead so this is the communication overhead and these are the set sizes here and like this is the validation cost we have compared this with the uh, ethereum and right now like uh, the uh, we have achieved some storage efficiency but like we have to check the uh, security properties of doing so like we are storing the metadata like we have to again reinvestigate the security properties and we have preserved the integrity of this chain so the future work is to distribute the storage overhead by using pre, -ag pre agreement among the neighbor nodes to store the sets and we have to further reduce the communication overhead with respect to set size thank you all thank thank you for that <laughs> i've got uh, i've got a question so can you talk me through the use case that, that you have? Are you assuming that every node has the whole of the uh, the ledger stored within them? No, sir. No, the node is not storing the entire ledger. Like suppose the ledger length is uh, it is having hundred blocks, and the storage capacity of a particular node is like forty blocks. What it will what it will do is it will delete the nodes, delete the blocks from one to sixty, and it will be storing uh, blocks full blocks from 61 to 100 so the node will won't be containing the entire ledger okay and and what's the use case of that so normally you would have a consensus network where devices who are fit enough to create the consensus would probably be uh, uh, the leader uh, of the network and then there would probably be other ones that would coming to be the consensus and those those devices are likely to have enough storage or they shouldn't really be part of the consensus network so perhaps you can talk us through what the basic use case is it sounds like you're much more distributed in your approach and there's no leader involved in, in the consensus so could you just take us through what you would see as as the use case for your application um so like we are aiming to make the uh, iot devices like uh, like existing protocols like whatever protocols for iot they are having they are make they are maintaining some local hierarchy like suppose like a very smaller iot device will be there and a little bit more uh, powerful iot device will be there the more po powerful iot device device will be uh, managing the consensus layer so like what we are thinking is like uh, it will create some form of centralization so maybe it is too idealistic but we are trying to clear that uh, to achieve decentralization to the lowest level so like uh, in the start like uh, there are uh, as i said in the second slide there are many things in the combination of iot and blockchain consensus low storage and many things are there like we are right now we are focused at low storage and these things and bringing consensus to these devices is the next thing we have to do we're aiming to do. That's great. Thank, th th thank you for that. And uh, so the next speaker up is uh, someone we've seen before at these conferences, and it's Alexander uh, from uh, Litsoft and the Gluskov Institute of Cybernetics. So are you there, Alexander? Yes, I'm here. Ah, that's great. So uh, if I could hand over to you. Th thank you for uh, making some time for this today. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you do you see my screen not yet not yet okay moment uh, uh, moment okay great thank you Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, good day, good morning, good evening. I'm Alexander. I represent 
the elite soft company and uh, the institute of cybernetic of the national academy of science of ukraine are presents our uh, team uh, and we are the mathematicians algebraics and followers of uh, famous algebraic school headed by academician victor glushko uh, in my presentation i will consider the usage of uh, an algebraic approach in the model driven development of dlt based application so today the development of protected and resistant uh, to attacks dlt based application is a very complicated program because usually the distributed system implement a large or infinite number of scenarios of system behavior and the exhaustive testing is impossible the errors, the errors on the early stage affect the result of product its quality terms and costs this is why we are talking about algebraic approach, formal methods, and model-driven development that became part of the standards for safety critical system. Algebraic approach allows to analyze uh, the system behavior on different level of abstraction, especially for different level of DLT application, consensus algorithm, token economy level, level of the smart contracts. This corresponding formal model of DLT application can be considered on different stage of the development on requiring gathering stage or design stage test in or coding. For purposes of the model driven development and formal methods usage, we present an algebraic virtual machine, AVM. The input of this uh, system is the formal specification of the known engineering or programming languages or algebraic models. On the front-end side, the languages are translated into the algebraic specification and the corresponding formal method can be invoked from the back-end from the algebraic server side. The algebraic server contains the set of the formal methods that were developed in the last 20 years by the scientists of our algebraic school and other formal methods developers. There are the methods of the formal verification, algebraic modeling, algebraic matching with corresponding database of the patterns, for example, patterns of cyber attacks or vulnerabilities for cybersecurity analysis. The methods I, could, are implemented. I, 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 I wonder if you're actually showing. Are you showing your your slides just now? We we can only yes, see the opening yes. slide. Yes. Do you see my slides? I, no. I think you may be sharing the. No. Ah, that's it. That's it now. If you could just move through like that. I see that I. Uh, uh, okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Everything okay now? Yep. Yep. We're, yes, we're seeing yes. the preview view, but that, that's fine. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the methods are implemented for different theories arithmetic, Boolean algebra, string, bit, byte, operation algebra, with the corresponding solving and proving machines. Test suite generation machines are also included in server. The user of AVM can add his own formal method by means of the special algebraic language a plan. Regarding uh, DLT-based application, we can consider as the input specification the smart contract in Solidity language for Ethereum platform or Ethereum virtual machine uh, byte code codes or JavaScript for EOS smart contract. The consensus algorithm are presented as the algebraic model in behavior algebra specification. The other DLT application can be presented also on the level of design right by the algebraic model or known design specification like UML or UCM. The input of AVM is permanently extended by the other kind of specification. This is the main value of AVM for the inventors for the formal methods. He can try his methods or theory against real industrial specification. This is an important attempt to bridge the gap between science and this industry. So let's consider the example of the model of the consensus algorithm in behavior algebra. We consider uh, one of the proof of stake variation presented in behavior algebra expression. Behavior algebra is a part of the Aplan language of the algebraic programming. In the example, there are three processes that work in parallel and presented by parallel composition of three behaviors. Every behavior consists of the uh, combination of atomic action 
function and other behaviors. In the algebraic presentation, we use the notion of the interacting agent that are the nodes of DLT systems. They produce transactions, select the block creators, validators, create and send block to the network. The behavior of the agents is presented by the system of equation in the behavior algebra and many tasks of verifications come down to the resolving of the system of uh, equations. Here we can see the list of the act atomic action or possible action that node can perform during the algorithm. The semantic of actions is presented by pre and post condition. They are given at the protocol to violate the rules, to perform actions in the orders that violate behavior sequence, to perform actions that are different from the available actions in the current time moment. Alexander, do not your perform... slide is not moving. May I type that? Your slide yeah, is why? not moving. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, now. Okay. Yeah, no, it's not good. Uh, so, having the algebraic model of the consensus, the possible essential malicious uh, actions can be generated automatically. There are no problem with the known vulnerabilities and attacks, but in, in our research, the definition of possible action that lead to a something bad, lose money, destroy the logic of algorithm, can be used for detection of uh, zero-day vulnerabilities. And also, it is the interesting question of the completeness of malicious sections. Having this set of the malicious and fair actions, we can reach the interesting property. For example, here one of the variety of the formula of double spending. To check if it's reachability, we can use different kind of symbolic modeling. So now a little bit of demo. Uh, okay. Uh, so here's the example of the algebraic virtual machine running. We select the specification and upload the uh, consensus model of consensus protocol, with contain, which is contain the agent, the environment description, the actions, behavior of action, formula of initial states, and formula of double spending attack. Then we uh, will run the uh, AVM. Uh, let's uh, assume that uh, we have the uh, four or three malicious agents and two fair, and we try to find the scenario attack where the double spending is possible. Uh, then consider one of the possible traits which illustrate on the blockchain visualizer, which illustrate the um, uh, <coughs> which illustrate uh, the attack. We can see the scenario of a malicious node delay the block sending for creation of the fork and try to keep the shorter chains to avoid uh, finaliz longer the shorter states as chains to avoid finalization. The more they can avoid the finalization, the more double spending payment they can perform. Okay, now. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other problem is uh, the decentralization. Uh, <coughs> the uh, formal model uh, of the consensus algorithm is the delegated proof of stake, where we have a permanent voting for block creators. Uh, this is the application of AVM on the uh, tokenomic level, and uh, EOS team uses the consensus algorithm and, algorithm and try to resolve the problem of the decentralization. It constantly permanently generates the new versions of uh, algorithm to overcome the decentralization problem. For example, one of the uh, the property of this, uh, the uh, the property of decentralization is that 70% of uh, the uh, stakeholders of of all talk, uh, uh, three stakeholders are the owners of 70% of all tokens. So we can present it by the algebraic formula of the centralization issue. We can check it for reachability for given version uh, using the AVM uh, formal methods. Next slide. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, the next possibility is to operate with. Okay, one minute. 
The next possibility is to operate with smart contracts. We can upload it and convert algebraic uh, uh, presentation. Um, the machine be uh, the malicious behavior and the vulnerability of contract can be formalized at the corresponding pattern. You can see the known attack, reentrance, the integer, the list of is permanently is extending. And uh, the last uh, slide is there. Uh, one of the uh, important part of the model-driven development is the generation of smart contract from the model. From here, the example of logistic system with the safety condition and tight delivery, etc. And the customers, vendors, and carriers, and uh, we can create the model uh, manually or the from or the integrated from the logistic system, and to generate the uh, smart contract. So thank you for the detail that I would like to present. This is uh, my presentation, um, Algebraic Virtual Machine. It will be available for free from the 1st of September of this year. And of course, you can contact me to get an account for this machine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, excellent. So I've got a quick question. So you're talking about the owners of, of tokens. So you're looking very much towards a tokenization infrastructure where I would assume that uh, entities traded these tokens so that you would assign the ownership of one entity to another. And I didn't quite understand how you divorce the owners of tokens from the consensus network. I assume the owners of, of tokens aren't making up the consensus. Could you maybe talk through that, that case? Maybe maybe it's better like, but maybe may, may be better to say that we have the three owners that have the uh, the uh, the biggest stake the biggest stake uh, the uh, the possibility to vote to vote for the uh, to vote for the validator who create the so uh, and then they uh, there, there will be the biggest part of the stake because for example we have three we are three and we have seventy percent to possibility to uh, to to be selected as a block generator, so this is uh, the uh, decentralization, and this uh, issue can uh, uh, can occur during the uh, during uh, during uh, corresponding to some scenario of the consensus protocol, and our uh, task is to detect such scenario which can lead to decentralization. The behavior of the all st stakeholders would. And it can lead to the such uh, uh, not uh, <coughs> such distribution, not fair distribution of the stake. Yeah. Yeah, I see. So, in, in a Bitcoin scenario, you would say that the miners were now the owners of the the Bitcoin. So there must be some way to detect when when these miners aren't consensus. So I, I suppose they could identify themselves differently. So they could be identified as a miner uh, with an IP address or a name, but then they come in as an owner of the tokens, and then these three entities get together and create a cartel and could possibly bounce tokens back and forward and escalate or inflate the uh, the value of the token. Uh, so is that is that the core scenario that you're looking at, is, is how miners or consensus agents would become... Uh, bad agents, uh, but we uh, we consider the uh, be, be, uh, proof of work. You, you mean proof of work? It uh, uh, the problem of decentralization not as such a big issue for Bitcoin, but it's a big issue for uh, proof of stake and proof of dele delegated proof of stake because we uh, there are a, a, a big variety of such algorithm and we uh, the most uh, uh, popular uh, algorithm from the literature, and we uh, uh, provide the scenario, but not for proof of work. Alexander, the next session is a st is a starting, so we, we okay. Move so, to the next so, so, yeah. So, th thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. So, uh, that's the end of this session. So, hopefully, uh, you can now go on to the next session. Thank Thanks you. very much for okay. attending. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Uh -huh. Solomon, we can end session and move to the next one. Okay.